Welcome to the Bad Roman Podcast. On this show, we talk with veterans, community leaders, Christians, and non-Christians as we explore the entanglement of Christians with the state. The Bad Roman Project was created out of the firm belief that as Christians, we are called to follow Christ, not the state. Here is your host, Craig Hargis. Hey, folks. Today, we're going to have another anarchist roundtable, and we have uh, Scott Goldman, Abby Kleckner, and new to the show, Jason Mock. We're going to be discussing a couple of the topics that have been presented to me over the past uh, couple of weeks. We got our right. marching orders, man. Left, right, left, right. We'd rather left, serve God than right. serve Caesar, you left, know me? Right, I'm just trying to live what he said. I'm just trying to live. Jason, since you're new, why don't you give us a little bit of background of yourself, and then we'll move forward. All right. Um, my name's Jason. I'm married with two kids. Uh, started this progression probably back around 2003, 2004, when I uh, mistakenly voted for George W. Bush. I was uh, thinking I was doing the right thing, and every success, uh, successful election that went past, and nothing changed. I realized that, well, okay, there's got to be a problem with the system. Nothing's changing. Um, 2008, got into Ron Paul, and he made boatloads of sense. Um, 2010 is when I voted for Thomas Massey and Rand Paul uh, when I lived in Kentucky. thought, okay, this is it. This is the wave of change. It's finally here. I've been waiting for it to come. And then, uh, again, nothing changed. Um, and I've just... I've seen the government get more violent and uh, more controlling. And so I, I realized that, okay, I've been spinning my wheels here for 10, 15 years. What, what's the deal? And so I uh, picked up my Bible and dug into it and started saying, how does, asking myself, how does God want me to interact in society? How does God view government? How does God view kings? What's its purpose? And uh, after about a year of studying that, I came to the conclusion that God wants to be the king. He is the king. Uh, he's the king who conquered death, and he's the one that saved uh, all of us. And so that's the person I'm going to follow. And so I've no longer put my trust in any governments and any men. Um, and now what I do is see through all the fear-mongering that they do and realize that they fear-monger to keep power and keep control. And so when you see through that, you can see all the harm that they do on all the people that they hurt. And uh, the real problem with society is society thinks that if their uh, preferred laws are implemented, that it will save everybody and it won't harm anybody. And that's not true. Every single one of them, I can point to some form of harm to somebody on the face of the earth. And so I, as a Christian, am supposed to love my neighbor. And if I'm going to love my neighbor, that means I don't harm them. And so I've just really stepped back from all of it and said, if I focus on Jesus and I focus on who he was and I model my life after his life, then that is the best way that I can show who the true king is and I can actually participate in the true everlasting kingdom that will never end. And in my study, I got into Daniel and um, realized that if Jesus is the rock that destroys all the kingdoms, why do I want to harness myself to something that's going to be destroyed? I want to harness myself uh, and be a slave of Jesus because he's the one that's everlasting. So that that's how I'm here today. I t uh, tell people I'm a Christian anarchist. Uh, some people find that word to be uh, very scary, and uh, I, it's not scary because it just means that I no longer subject myself directly to the kingdoms of this world, and I'm focused on the kingdom of Jesus. I don't know if anybody else that, that's involved with the show right now that's listening to that, but I'm over here just, I want to stand up and start applauding Jason right now because this is so familiar to my story. And I think it's familiar to a lot of our stories that have come this way, you know, into Christian anarchism. You know, we all come from similar backgrounds, it seems like, and you get to a point where you realize, all right, and just like Jason said, this is only getting worse. 
or, you know, nothing is changing. And in my opinion, it's, it's gotten worse with every election. You can go from Bush to Obama to Trump and everything has gotten worse. Wars are escalating. They're trying to uh, implement more power over us. You know, at the time of this recording, you can see that going on with this whole coronavirus thing too, that they're using this to push more power over us. And it's, and it's the, the biggest frustration for me with all that is Americans are applauding it. And that drives me crazy. You were, you were applauding and you know, the same thing happened after 9-11. We were asking for more security. Well, once you start freely giving, it's one thing from to sign legislation behind closed doors to take uh, liberties from us. But it's another thing when you start freely asking them to do it, you'll never get those rights back. They're gone. Scott, you had your, your hand raised. Yeah. As Jason was speaking, I had my mic muted because I was just wanting to amen all over the place. <clears throat> and I love what you had to say. Um, the second thing is, yes, I see exactly what you're talking about with this coronavirus thing um, becoming like, the, in a sense, the new 9-11. You know, we can't do away with TSA now because of what because of 9-11 and the thing that's worrying me um, about what's coming next is a possible mandatory vaccination and it's just being thrown at us as you know this is what you need to do for the good of humanity so to speak and it's like we're not allowed to question this information you know they're, they're giving us only a, one side of the argument and not giving us the, the, the descending voice or dissenting voice um, that's saying, hey, maybe this is not such a good idea. And we need both. And that's what, you know, like this country is supposed to have is the freedom. And that's what I see definitely just eroding away and, and going away 100%. Um, and that's what I think this could be leading to. Yep. It's scary times, man. You know, Jesus tells us not to be anxious about anything, but I think in our human nature, we, there's many things about this that are going to scare us, especially if you, if you value your liberties. So, we have a couple of topics we're going to go over. The first topic, and these are questions that I get almost on a daily basis, but over the you know, past couple of weeks, I get messages on our Facebook page or you know, interactions with other people in face-to-face -face time. And one of the things that was when we're talking about Christian anarchism and how, you know, no king but Christ, this question came or the statement came from another Christian. And he said, to say we don't need a government rejects the biblical truth of a fallen world. I don't want to imagine a world with pacifist Christians and godless tyrants. Who would like to start with that one? Um, I could easily make the argument that's kind of what we have now. I mean, if I look at the mainstream Christian church, they don't speak truth to power. And that's what the church is supposed to do. Uh, we're supposed to be the voice of those who are in need. And to kind of keep power to be helpful for the people, not to be dominating the people. Um, so that question to me is like somebody that doesn't have their eyes open to what our current reality really is. Yeah, I would just say it like we, we totally have godless tyrants now. I don't know <laughs> why he thinks if we didn't have a government that would be different somehow. I don't know. I think um, people, yes, I think anarchism is the only philosophy that addresses that it actually is a fallen world like i know we hear this a lot but um you know the if people are all evil or have the capacity for evil the government is made up of people they're just people who have special powers to have all the weapons and to be able to act without consequences so we're basically creating a system where the worst people in society are given extra special powers over the rest of us. Um, it's not like government is made up of like people who aren't human beings. It really attracts the worst of humanity because if you said to like a normal person, well, I don't know, say if you had like a neighborhood and you were like, okay, so we want to have one person who gets to have lots of machine guns and they get to decide what everyone else gets to do and they're going to shoot people who don't follow those rules. You would kind of expect everybody in the neighborhood to be like, oh, I don't want to do that. I don't want to shoot my neighbors or make up rules like that. Um, the person who would step up and be like, yeah, I want to do that. Like that's the person who should not have power like that. And I think that's kind of how government works. 
Uh, there's two pieces to this question that they have, or two statements that they make that we're kind of using as a question. But the first is to say we don't need a government rejects the biblical truth of a fallen world. Nobody has said we don't need a government. We have said that we need Christ to be our government. That's what 1 Samuel 8 is all about. God goes to his people and says, I am your king and I am your government and here is my law and follow it. So nobody's rejecting it and that has nothing to do with the the biblical truth of a fallen world it actually is acknowledging the biblical truth of a fallen world because it recognizes that those leaders are in those positions and are uh, generally evil because of the fallen world so do we want to again harness ourselves to jesus who is perfect or do we want to harness ourselves to somebody who is leading a entity that Jesus wrecks and destroys as the stone that Daniel talks about? We don't. We want to harness ourselves to Jesus. So the biblical truth is we are in a fallen world. And the biblical truth then from that is that we need to follow the eternal kingdom and the eternal king that is not corruptible. And so uh, I don't reject any government. I completely submit myself to the government of Jesus. The second piece is I don't want to imagine a world with pacifist Christians and godless tyrants. Um, I feel like this does a, a huge disservice to especially the early church. Uh, we know what Nero did to Christians. We know how Romans 12 and 13 says for Christians to respond. Um, we don't have to imagine a world with pacifist Christians and godless tyrants. We've had it for a long time. And Christians endured for a long time and have endured for a long time. And I think that just does a very – it's just a disservice to the Christians that were burned at the stake or set on fire or tarred and feathered and used to light the paths of Nero's gardens. Um, there is – you don't have to imagine it. It has been and is been and will continue to be. Uh, today we see China and how they – are rounding up Christians and they're disappearing for 10 years hard labor, 20 years hard labor, and nobody knows what's happening to them. Um, you know, even in our COVID-19 situation here, we have how uh, people can't get together and pray together, or they're going to be ticketed or put on a list or forced to quarantine. Um, there are godless tyrants all over the face of the earth. And um, Christians are told in Romans 12 and 13 to be pacifists. So if they don't want to imagine it, I hate to break it to them, but they're going to have to live it because uh, godless tyrants are here and pacifist Christians are here. And, and we're here to act as Jesus has told us to act and to not resist the evil one and to, to turn the other cheek. Uh, to love your neighbor, to do good to those who hate you, to feed those who hate you, to give water to those who hate you. Um, so I, I would tell them that they need to adjust their idea of what they're imagining because they don't have to imagine that. It, it's always been since Jesus came. Yeah. Um, if we look at the example of Jesus when he was here on earth and people had the expectation that he was going to be a political leader and that he was going to lead kind of a violent revolution that would liberate Israel. And that is like absolutely the opposite of what he actually did, you know, through loving enemies and tearing down barriers and really being a pacifist is how Jesus led not a revolution to liberate Israel, but a revolution that would liberate the entire world in a way that nobody saw coming. So I think I Christians can kind of have a tendency to like the early Israelites to want Jesus to be a political leader who is going to liberate them more physically than spiritually. Um, and I don't think those two things are necessarily completely separate, but I think it can't start from the top down. It has to start from the bottom up and people's hearts being changed. And that's not what you get when you're seeking political power and laws and things like that. Even uh, even if Christians were to come into government and make laws that were more favorable to Christianity, it's just that that is not the model that Jesus gave us for how to bring God's kingdom and how to change the world. And there's a reason for that. And that's because it does not work to do it that way. It doesn't work to force people to do what you think is right, to set up 
yeah, some kind of legal system that will force everyone to act like Christians. Like that doesn't change hearts and that that's just not the way that it's going to work to do it. As far as pacifism goes, and I'm kind of leaning that way. I, I struggle with it myself, but I don't, I think it's misunderstood from what I can tell that people or how people view pacifist or pacifism is it's, it's, it's weak. All right, here's an example. What do you do if somebody is being, being harmed by another person? Do you just stand there and let it happen? They, they, they view pacifism that way that you just, you don't interfere with that. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Yeah. So that's along the same kind of lines. It's that it's not, it's not that you're powerless. It, you're using the power of the Holy Spirit, which works in a totally different way than the world works. So um, being a pacifist doesn't mean sitting around and doing nothing. Jesus actually said, blessed are the peacemakers. And so you're not like uh, peace waiters. <laughs> you know, you're le- you have to be active in bringing about peace in the world. It's not about like uh, seeing an old lady on the street getting robbed and being like, well, I'm a pacifist, so too bad for her. It's coming up with, um, first of all, the way that you're being in the world is creating more peace, serving people around you, fulfilling needs before they get to like a desperate place of where they would harm someone else. And then second of all, when you do come into those kinds of situations, um, having, I guess, the creativity to to solve problems in a way where you are acting lovingly toward everyone involved, where you're not um, seeing someone as the bad guy and seeing someone as the good guy, and it's okay for me to hurt the bad guy because it serves the greater good, then no, you would see everyone in the most loving way possible and would want to bring about peace in that situation in a way that is I guess, healing towards everyone. Like God has put us in the position to where we're here to help him with the healing and restoration of the entire world. So to do that, we can't bring that kind of stuff around through violence. It's just impossible. That's not the way it works. And so I think you have to have kind of keep your eye on the bigger picture of seek first the kingdom in every solution that you're going to come up with, seek first the kingdom. And if you, that's your mindset, then everything else is going to work out in the best way possible. Well, I, I think the um, big thing to understand with pacifism is it's more about pacify. So if a baby is crying, do you shake it? Or do you try to find out what's wrong with it, why it's crying, and you try to solve the solution properly? And um, so what people get upset about pacifism, and and I'll say right up front, if you're not a Christian, I don't expect you to ever understand pacifism. Um, We are made and nature is made such that we try to prolong our life. And so if you don't believe in an afterlife, if you don't believe in Jesus, pacifism is not going to make any sense to you because you think you have a a, a single life that you're trying to extend versus realizing you're an eternal being anyhow. And so that's the big thing. And, And I think Jesus addresses that perfectly when he says, he who saves his life will lose it, but he who loses his life for my sake will save it. If you are uh, out trying to extend your life here on earth and you think shooting somebody solves that, guess what? It's not going to help you in the long run. And and, I, and a lesson I gave recently uh, about Jesus and pacifism, basically, um, there were some good comments from the crowd afterwards. And, and somebody says, hey, so, so don't you think maybe we should you know, consider that we have to shoot somebody? I said, I'll gladly consider it. Show me the one person in the Bible that did it. Show me the one person in the Bible that that struck their attacker. Show me the person in the Bible that used a a sword and wasn't rebuked. You know, uh, Stephen, when he's being stoned by Paul, if he gets up and uses a sword to strike his attackers and Paul down, where does that get us? Was Paul not used later by Jesus to be a massive influence? What What if Stephen had thought, oh, I need to kill my attackers? You know, there's a whole bunch of things to consider because Jesus is 
and God are working the things for their people for eternity. And we get so short-sighted. And so the thing I would say about pacifism is, to go back to the baby example, there are things that you can do, plenty of things, that don't involve shooting somebody. You know, everybody always wants to say, well, well what if somebody breaks into your home? I, I can run. I can pray. I can shield my family. I can lock the door. I can ask them if they're here to take my TV and help them unbolt my TV and put it in their car because it's a TV. Who cares? There are so many things that we can do that don't involve shooting somebody and being violent in return. And I think society just just found that that's the convenient solution. You know, it's the solution that's accepted. And so, you know, shoot them and give it, get it over with. I think we're all kind of probably familiar with the uh, scene in Indiana Jones where the guy's swinging a sword around and then Indiana Jones just whips out a pistol, shoots him and moves on. That's kind of how society tends to operate. And, and that's not love for your neighbor. Love for your neighbor is going to make things complicated. It's going to make solutions uh, seem more difficult, peaceful solutions. But in the end, if you're trying to save your life, he who loses his life for my sake will save it. If you're trying to love your neighbor and you are trying to uh, be peaceful and you're trying to feed them or give them water, as Romans 12 says, to do to your enemy, and you die, so what? Really, that needs to be the mind of the Christian. So what? And I think that's why Paul says to live is Christ and to die is gain. Who Who is, is here to turn down gain? If I try to offer any of y'all $10,000, are any of y'all going to turn it down? Nope. We're all after some gain. And so uh, dying as a Christian is gain. It's not bad. Society has got us into their mindset of thinking it's bad and that we need to try to do everything we can to extend our life here. And that's where you get things like we need to turn uh, all the sand into glass before they come over here and attack your children and all this fear mongering. And it's because they're short sighted. They're worried about here. They're not worried about eternity. And so if you're not a Christian, again, I don't expect pacifism to make sense. But if you are a Christian, I would strongly encourage everyone to look at Jesus, to look at Romans 12, to look at all the apostles and disciples and everybody throughout Scripture and the New Testament and really examine who attacked someone uh, and did violence towards anybody that was approved of. There's not one. You won't find it. And so that's something Christians need to consider. Uh, yeah, that, all that was great, man. Great to listen to. Um, I think some of the things that we wind up doing in our thought process, especially as Americans, or maybe it's just humans in general, is we, we put in things into all or nothing categories. Um, like, so if we, in a sense, judge the pacifist as doing nothing, that's really not the truth, you know, like, like Jason was saying. Um, but I think the thing that we miss also with these questions we ask is we don't ask the question to us like, okay, so if there's something bad going on, what am I going to do? If I don't want to see a passive Christian society, does that mean that I'm going to do nothing if my neighbor's getting attacked? I, I think we, in a sense, we're trying to duck the responsibility also that I believe God gave us from the beginning of, are you your brother's keeper? Um, we're trying to put that on government and that's, that's, that's for us. And that's for each one to his fellow man, in my opinion. Yeah, I love that. That's a really good point. Um, and I would also just add, yes, we have a view of eternity. That doesn't mean like, I totally don't care if I die or I don't care if my kids are like brutally murdered in front of me or whatever. Like, <laughs> like lives are still very precious, but we do have that view of eternity. But I would also add that it's, it's also an effective solution. Like, it's not like, well, we could choose violence because the means justify the ends and that gets us to a better end like no that's not true the means are the ends like if i'm choosing to live peacefully now and not increase the violence in the world that is going to lead to a more peaceful world and like if you look at examples of of people using nonviolent resistance in history like in the civil rights movement or like um gandhi in india if they had chosen to take one moment where someone had been oppressed or um, beaten or put in jail or 
something and react violently in that situation. I mean, it's possible they could have, I don't know, killed someone who was being violent. And maybe there would have been slightly uh, more of what the world would, I guess, call justice in that specific situation. But because instead of fighting back, they chose to resist nonviolently, it created these larger movements and it catches people's attention and it's able to change hearts and make real change in the world rather than being short-sighted and seeing your one situation. And like Scott was saying, getting into that kind of black and white mentality, well, either I have to shoot this person or terrible things are going to happen to my family. We have to come up with a more creative solution and doing that causes hearts to change and causes a bigger movement in society toward peace and away from violence because people see the possibility in that and they see the beauty in that. Like I think we as humans, even if you're not a Christian, can recognize if a situation could have gone really, really badly, but you see how a person came up with a creative solution and ended up with stopping the violence and coming out with something peaceful and beautiful and there's healing like everybody has the capacity to recognize that that is the better thing and the, the way that we should be trying to go and to your point and, and what jason was talking about as well i've had this the response i've had this response when talking about this that, that well you're just waiting around to die which is absurd i'm not just sitting around waiting to die you know, and it's like you said, lives are still precious. Yeah, I really liked the language that Abby used there. And also, I think Jason said it as well as the creativity when it comes to pacifism. Um, and what it reminded me of, and I won't speak from a Christian perspective, I'll speak kind of from a world religion perspective that shows, say, the creation as different than the other religions. God creates the world in seven days, you know, rests on the rests on the seventh anyway. Um, and that's really different than the Enuma Elish, which was the popular creation story way back when. And it was uh, Marduk and other gods and this whole chaos thing happened out in the world and humanity is created out of violence. That's where the Hebrew story is different. God is a creative art, artist who makes things to good, not one that is violent. Um, and that's really what is a separate thing that I, since we don't really get into the deep meanings of Hebrew scriptures, sometimes as evangelicals, this story has been around for thousands of years and we don't see it for its nonviolence anymore. And it gets covered up with our American Christianity and kind of our war hungry culture. Well, let's face it, we live in an empire and this is how empires thrive is they dominate. Um, and kind of like going back to the the bad Roman project, you know, we're starting to see that our way of life is not what God is calling us to. Yeah, I just wanted to go back to what Abby was talking about pacifism and just kind of clarify. Again, it doesn't mean you do nothing. It just means that your response is a nonviolent response. And Jesus gives all those examples in the early part of the New Testament when he's talking about dealing with the Roman uh, infantry. You know, things like if he wants you to go with him one mile, go with him two. Those things uh, that Jesus recommends in that set of scripture there are all very uh, passive aggressive. They are pacifist things that are aggressive in return um, to make a point. You know, um, how humiliating is it if, uh, you know, you go to court to sue somebody for their cloak and in front of the whole whole court they give you their cloak and their tunic makes you look like a really bad person um and yet and yet no violence had to be enacted um it's the same with um dale carnegie in his book uh how to uh influence people and, and make friends he talks about um how to use these types of situations and to actually get basically get what you want or get a good outcome and he talks about how he goes to a park to walk his dog and there's a police officer there and he says sir the sign says no walking your dog off leash you need to put him on a leash if i see you again i'm going to give you a ticket and he said so the next time i go out i'm walking my dog no leash same officer says sir i told you already if you don't put your dog on a leash, the sign says you're getting a ticket. So I've already let you off once. This time you're getting a ticket. 
and he and he says basically in his story, I said, you know, thank you, officer, for for reminding me again. I'm I'm sorry I didn't listen to you the first time. Can you can you please write that ticket out to me? And when you take away that power flex, the solution to the story is the officer says, Well, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna let you off again this time, but next time you watch out. And and the whole thing is taking away those flexes of power. And you can do it in a nonviolent way, and you can actually use it to change hearts and minds of other people. And so, you know, that doesn't mean you're watching your kids get murdered. Uh, I'm not going to sit and watch my kids get murdered. Abby's not going to sit and watch her kids get murdered. But neither of us are going to whip out a machine gun and try to blast everything in sight either. You know, there are things we're going to do. And uh, as I talked about in my lesson of Jesus and pacifism, at the very end, you know, one solution to pacifism and protecting your, your children from the murderer, for example, is you can do what Jesus did. That's you can sacrifice yourself. That is always an option and solution. It's an option that Jesus took, and it's an option that Jesus showed us is available. And, you know, if I have to sacrifice myself so that my wife and kids can, can escape some intruder and jump in the car and, and run, I'm all for it. Uh, That doesn't mean I'm, you know, not going to, that doesn't mean I'm going to stand by and watch them get harmed. I am going to do something. I'm just not going to use violence. Yeah, great, Jason. Um, Yeah, I just, one of the things that just popped in my head, um, it's the hardest thing to do at times is loving your enemy. And I think that is the real challenge of Christianity. If, you know, if I, I can love God well, especially because He's invisible and we don't really know how to do it correctly. But the second is love your neighbor as yourself. And then Jesus takes it that next step farther of love your enemy. And that's where I think most of us have the struggle. But the reality is there is such power in loving your enemy. And in a sense, when you go that extra mile or give that tunic, that can sometimes be um, kind of embarrassing for that person. But also when you can see past their aggression and see what their real need is and you meet that need, then they're no longer wanting to dominate you. And they actually, when you're starting to love your enemy and like, like imagine carrying that backpack out of love for that soldier that that's making you do it for one mile. And you're like, Hey, I want to take this farther for you. So your life's going to be a little easier from here on out. It's just going to take that much burden off your back. I want to carry that for you. That dude wants to be your friend now. You know, it, it, it changes things. Um, and I think sometimes when we get stuck in that selfish mindset of, I have to do this, it should be more of a, hey, I get to do this because this is loving my neighbor as myself. Loving my enemy is what really changes the world, not putting force on somebody to carry my pack. This reminds me of something that Abby said in, in our first episode uh, when she said, we're here, to, we're here to grow the good. God will take care of the evil. And I think that's something that we should we should try to remember when we're dealing with situations like this. All right. So let's say uh, let's, let's switch gears just a little bit. All right. So this is something that came or a question that was came to, it was offered to me the other day at work. And we're talking well, I try to talk about a voluntary society. Um, that a lot of it's deflection to me, but he, he goes, well, he goes, would you be okay with a draft into the military? And I said, absolutely not. And he said, if not, how would you defend a voluntary society without enough people enlisted in the military? Yeah. So, I mean, first of all, like, yes, uh, it's really interesting to me how many people are okay with a draft. Like, I don't know. We've had drafts in history and everyone signs up for the draft. So I guess it's been normalized. But like, that's slavery. That's slavery. There's like no other way to say it. That except people being totally okay with slavery and looking down on people who avoid their conscript, conscription into slavery and not only regular slavery, but a slavery where you go kill people that you don't know. Like it really boggles my mind how okay our society is with the draft and having three boys myself thinking about the idea that each of them is going to be enlisted for the draft and whether it actually happens or not, it's just a horrifying, horrifying thought to me as a mom that basically armed thugs can come and take my kids and force them to go kill people across the ocean. It's just absolutely insane to me. Um, 
I don't know if we want to keep talking about the draft before we get into like a voluntarist society's idea of defense, but I don't know. Does anyone else have anything to say about the draft? <laughs> well, I, I would just, uh, this is the non-Christian perspective here. This is just the general worldly perspective here, uh, libertarian perspective. If the mission and the goal is good, or at least viewed as good, there won't need to be a draft. People will sign up. Uh, go back and look at World War II. People went out December 8th and were signing up in droves to go to this war because they were attacked. They didn't know at the time that uh, uh, why they got attacked or how, but they knew they were attacked and they, they knew that they were responding. Compare that to Vietnam or Korea, and you had so many people. They had to draft because nobody wanted to go sign up for it because it was just not a noble cause. It wasn't a good cause. And so, uh, you know, even in a libertarian society, if it's a good and worthy cause, people will sign up for it. And I think the easiest thing to do is to point to uh, Americans' favorite of the Revolutionary War. There was no government. There was no draft. There was no official military. All these people were in a voluntary society. And what did they do? They came together and fought off England. So... How this idea comes about that you, you have to draft people or there'll be nobody to fight is ridiculous. We can go point to a whole bunch of countries recently. You know, We can point to uh, tons of stuff in history. We can go talk about the Alamo. We can go talk about the Battle of San Jacinto in Mexico versus Texas. We can go talk about Libya and the revolution there and, the, and Iraq and the revolution there and, and all these people – came together, not drafted, and, and fought off governments. So there is no requirement to have a draft. There is no requirement to even have a government if the cause, in a at least libertarian mindset, is good and noble. Um, and so, no, draft's not needed. Draft's ridiculous. Uh, draft is actually bad. I don't want somebody next to me that I'm depending my life on with that doesn't want to be there and, and isn't taking it seriously because they don't believe in the same cause that I do. That just puts me at risk. Uh, why would I want those people uh, grouped with me? So even the idea of a draft in general is, is just a bunch of hooey. You know, uh, it, it's forcing people into something that they don't want to do. And when you force people to do something that they don't want to do, particularly go kill people, um, they don't, they're not going to do it to the best of their ability. They're going to do the minimum that they need to do to get out alive and, and return back to home and return back to normal. They are not going to perform at any high level at all. So the draft is just bad straight across. Um, most wars in history have been won and handled by voluntary societies. So uh, it's the history's there. Right. I remember it reminds me, so uh, after 9-11, a guy I was going to church with, me and him went and signed up for the Arkansas National Guard. And we thought, you know, at the time it was a noble cause. But thankfully I have a, a bit of a belly, so I was four pounds overweight and they didn't accept me. <laughs> so he uh, he he got accepted. He said one of the first things that happened when they, when they were on the ground in, in, in Afghanistan was that they were in, involved in a firefight. That's terrifying to me, man. I mean, as soon as you, your boots hit the ground, you're, you're, you're in, in a firefight with people that you don't know. So to try and force people into a uh, military, just like Jason said, to me is not going to be beneficial, especially if you're next to somebody that has no interest in being there. They were forced into this. They don't have any interest in defending liberties. They want to just go home. Yeah, the only thing I think I could add is I don't think many people want war at all. It's usually just a select few that that want control and want power. Um, and those of us everyday folks, man, I mean, what do we really want? We, we work hard we take care of our families and we want to enjoy our downtime. Um, I, I know with, it is a fallen world. Yes. You know, we have evil people out there, but I think sometimes we get so consumed in our fears of a big monster, like a Russia coming to take us over. At least that's what the government always tries to feed us. You know, there was a cold war over it. I mean, I'm blowing it out of proportion, of course, but I think it comes down to like, what are you going to live out of? Are you going to live out of love or are you going to live out of fear? Because you can't really do both. Um, and if I'm always scared 
that other people are going to attack and hurt me. I, I'm not going to have a very enjoyable life. But if I can be loving towards people who might want to attack and hurt me, like I said earlier, man, loving your loving your enemy is difficult, but there's power in it, and you could you could you could wind up even making friends um, through through situations like that. So to me, it's just it, it, this this whole thing gets played. We get played. I'll put it that way by our fears from government and media and, and everything else. It just it's just all I can see out of it. I just yeah, that's it. Um, yeah, I would just add, like, really, even the idea of war comes from kind of collectivist thinking, like thinking of we as a country versus an, another they as another country, like an us versus them, like we're different somehow. Um, like wars are started by governments. It's people who are in this political ruling class who have disagreements with each other and they are able to buy a draft or these days buy like fabulous propaganda, get people to fight these battles on their behalf. Um, I heard this story. I don't know if this is actually true, but that uh, before Desert Storm won, that Saddam Hussein offered to settle the disagreement by just having a duel with George Bush the first George Bush and uh, that, that everyone like laughing that off as being ridiculous. And well, that's not how wars work. And um, I'm sure that if I had heard that back when I was a statist, I would have been like, yeah, what a psycho that guy is. That's not how the world works. But now it's like, well, yeah, I mean, if they're gonna, it's their problem. It's not all these people who are signed up for the military's problem. They don't even really know what they're fighting for. And and if it's a problem between those two political leaders, have them fight it out and leave everyone else out of it. Um, if we didn't have a government, say, over the United States, like, first of all, we wouldn't be imposing sanctions on other countries and interfering with their political processes and all these things that stir up trouble in the world and cause people to want to go to war. But also it wouldn't be if, if another country happened to decide they wanted to attack us for whatever reason, which I don't think is a reasonable fear. Um, but it wouldn't be like, yes, we're attacking the United States. And if we get their government to concede to our government, then we win and get in certain things. It would instead be, this other country or whatever deciding they want to attack 350 million individual people. And that is a much more daunting task. If it's like, well, yeah, just because something happens in Washington, DC, that doesn't affect my life. That doesn't mean that you have the right to tell me what to do. Like you're going to have to come to my house and force things on me if you want that to have any effect on me. And that's precisely why we lost in Vietnam and why we've been losing in Afghanistan is because it we're not fighting, the U.S. military isn't fighting against, um, a, you know, standing army and a political power. They're fighting against all these individual people who are willing to protect where they live. Um, so it's just, it, when you think about it from that perspective, it's like, well, yeah, without a state, war doesn't really exist in the same way that we think about it now. Right. That reminds me of something I heard on, on Scott Horton's show. And, you know, our involvement in Yemen still, I don't understand it, but they are targeting hospitals and, and uh, water supplies, like, you know, with this, the water sanitation. So the amount of cholera the, the rates of cholera going up in, in Yemen because they, they don't even clean water. Just the idea that, and this is our government. This is just like you said, it's, it doesn't involve me. I'm, I don't know anybody from Yemen or in Yemen, but this is a, it's a, it's, it's governments fighting with each other. Like you said, and I want to amen that get up and let them go fight it out themselves leave us out of it i'm really on board with that idea to be honest with you i like how you said that of like what they're doing to the yemen people it's really not affecting the yemen government you know those people are going to be well taken care of with, when this is all over um same thing but you go back to the bible days and that was one of the you know problems of leaving a king alive you know um showing him favoritism was not uh, viewed good from the Hebrew scriptures but that's kind of what would happen back in those days is like all oh, my people are dead well you don't have to punish me anymore um and I'm a huge mixed martial arts fan. So honestly, I would love to see like 
people battle it out that way over sanctions or over uh, over trade. And honestly, if we use like <laughs> to be funny, <laughs> um, Russia would be dominating us because Putin is like a hardcore Sambo fan and a, and a great wrestler. <laughs> and it would be funny to watch these old guys just going at it. <laughs> that would be hilarious. But they don't want that. <laughs> I mean, honestly, like I, I respect the Saddam Hussein thing being, you know what? Okay, it's me and you that have the problem. Let's go toe to toe over this. I respect that, but I don't respect is sitting. And I'm going to say it this way: poor people's kids, because a lot of times our military is built of people who don't really have the same shot as others. It does target the poor. It gives them a chance to kind of make something of themselves at the risk of losing their life in, in battle. Um, it seems way more humane to me to have these guys just duke it out, you know, and, and yeah, have the UFC rules in there, have the, the guy who's going to stop it with the tap out. You don't have to fight to the death. You just got humiliated. And that's one of the things I think we just don't do well anymore. I can remember being a kid and we box it out in the trailer park. Yeah. It was humiliating to lose, but you took your lumps and you just got on with life. Let me put a, a, a bad image in y'all's head. Can y'all imagine Donald Trump walking up in a pair of tights <laughs> and then, Let's get all these people, you know, like a, a wrestling battle royale, just, just get them all in the ring together. And the last one standing wins. I can't imagine that. I feel like. No, well, I want you to think about that for the rest of the day, by the way. And just <laughs> let it, let it, let it marinate on your brain. WWE is like the closest thing to politics. Like it's such a reflection of how it really works. Of Like everyone has their persona and their trash talking but like none of it's real it's just for the audience like oh my gosh that's so politic i, I heard somebody make that point on on another podcast i was listening to and, and I, i'd never thought of it that way but it's it's exactly right politics is like wrestling you know we with since all this has started you know we don't have sports anymore and this is driving me crazy because football seasons will be right around the corner <laughs> so espn showing old uh wrestling matches and we're watching this on, on TV at work on our break. And then another TV has got Fox News on it. And I'm sitting there thinking, you know what? This is way more believable than what those people are saying behind me on, <laughs> on Fox News. It is. Uh, I was just going to say, if you uh, look throughout history and you look at the long-term effects, not the short-term effects, because those can be argued. But if you look at the long-term effects, there's not a good outcome for more. Um You'll have people, I mean, let's just take uh, World War One and World War Two. World War One came about, uh, the, the Germany lost, and what did the winners do? They went and put all these sanctions on Germany. They went and took all these, uh, uh, all the money from Germany to repay for the war, and what did they do? They crashed the German economy. They harmed all the German citizens that really had no part in the war. Uh, they made their lives m complete misery. And what did that do? That fueled them looking for change. That fueled them looking to get out from under the thumb of the winners of World War I. And, and, and what happened? Oh, World War II. You know, um, there just isn't good outcomes from stuff, uh, from war specifically. Um, you can go look at Korea or Vietnam. No good outcome, just a bunch of loss of life. Uh, you can go look at the War of 1812. No good outcome, just a lot, bunch of loss of life. You can go look at Napoleon and, and all that he did across all the different countries that he went and conquered. And, and nothing good came from that, just a bunch of loss of life. War simply doesn't produce good outcomes. And so that's the real reason I'm opposed to it is because, you know, you can look at over, the overthrow of Saddam and what it's done to Iraq. You can look at the uh, the overthrow in Libya and what it's done to Libya. And you can look at all these different countries and all the people harmed, all the people displaced, the people starving, the cholera in Yemen that we've already uh, talked about. Uh, those are all the outcomes of war, and they are not good, and they harm people. And, and to go back to something I said in, in my intro at the beginning of this, that's why I'm against it all now. I am tired of being uh, uh, strapped to entities that harm people. I want to be like Jesus. I want to love people. And so that means that I have to put away those entities that harm people. And, and I'm just tired of uh, people getting short-sighted and they think, oh, this war will solve this right now. And they don't take into account the millions and millions of lives that are constantly impacted by war, both both now but also the long term. 
you know, World War II would have never happened if World War I would not have been handled in the way it was handled. Uh, the nuclear bombs that, that were dropped on Japan would have never had to have been dropped if there would have been a World War II because of how World War I was handled. Uh, there's just not good outcomes. And, and we get short-sighted and we think this will solve it. And it doesn't solve it. It makes things worse. It, it, it just harms so many people. And, and it's, it's sad. And it's gotten to where it actually just disgusts me. Yeah. And to the point that all three of y'all made, it's excellent, was that it's, it's not harming the other government. It's, it's harming individual people who, who would have no interest in harming us until now. I mean, think about it. If, if they were over here attacking us, we'd probably respond the way they're responding to us. You know, there's a reason why they hate us. Yeah. And I just think like, especially if you look at the wars that are going on right now and they've been going on for so long and like, what would winning even look like like does anybody have any kind of idea like is there any goal in sight that it's just oh we're we're it's the war on terrorism which is an abstract concept and we're fighting that war by becoming the biggest terrorists in the world and it's just crazy like there there's not even an end goal anymore but it's just it's really supported by the military industrial complex and politicians like Every politician elected in my lifetime ran on some form of campaigning of reducing war or ending war or pulling troops back. And as soon as they get in office, they change their tune really quick because they're owned by the military industrial complex. And as long as lots and lots of companies are making money off of that, we don't really have to have a goal. We just have to keep the war going. And it it does not. People think that the the state is its function is to protect us and to uh, make our lives better. But that that's not what they function out of at all. It's to make money and it's to keep power. And that is it, the whole point of the current wars we're in right now. And the huge loss of life and the huge just increase in horrible, horrible conditions and poverty. And like you were talking about the cholera, like th- so many things that are just unimaginable like we have no frame of reference for what we're doing over to people in the middle east because they've been able to paint them to us as the bad guys in order to keep up their wars to support the companies who are making money off of it yeah and what you said about uh, if you go if you go read the definition of terrorism or, or terrorists and read it and cannot s- compare that to how the united states government is acting then you're you're just you're just blinded to it or you're intentionally blinded to it and because we have become the largest terrorist organization in the world our government has i say i shouldn't say we but our government has well guys you got y'all have anything else y'all want to add to this and yeah the thing that just rings i don't know why it's on my mind so heavy but the are you your brother's keeper it just keeps popping in my head and it's like i look at this coronavirus thing going on or whatever threats that we have that's a question we really need to be asking ourselves. Am I my brother's keeper? And the, and the answer I believe is yes. And you know how we're kind of pushing towards a socialist society. I think it's pretty obvious. Um, and in a sense, it's like we're trying to give up that responsibility and put it on other people and not do it ourselves. But what I see out of it though, is like we can't have a responsible society if we don't have responsible individuals. So it just leads me back to that. Am I going to be my brother's keeper? And I think that's what we need to think about sometimes when we ask these hard questions of, you know, should there be a draft? Well, you know, it's funny you bring that up. Am I my brother's keeper? Really is just another way of how Jesus frames it in a parable with, and who is my neighbor? You know, uh, so many, so many people are asking the question, well, well, who is my neighbor trying to get out of stuff? Uh, You know, quit trying to get out of having to do something good. I don't understand why we want to try to wiggle out of doing something good to somebody because we're trying to determine that they're not worth it. Well, if Jesus thought we were worth it, they're worth it too. And that's the attitude that Christians just need to firmly adopt. All right. Well, I'll just, I'll let Jason have that final word and uh, you'll get back to your day. Thanks for joining us this week on the Bad Roman Podcast. You can subscribe to the show wherever podcasts are found. 
And if you like what you hear, be sure to leave us a rating, as it is the best way to help other people find us. Hey folks, Craig here, and I'd like to let y'all know we are always looking for writers to contribute to our blog. I don't care if you have any experience or not. Two or three of our contributors had no prior experience writing, and it turns out they have a real knack for it. Our project coordinator helps them put the articles together, and she publishes them on our website and Facebook page, and you will also have the option to come on the show and go more in depth about your article. So if you like what we're doing at The Bad Roman, and would like to try your hand at writing, and send us an email at thebadromanpodcast at gmail.com. If you would like to donate to the show, learn more, or connect with us, you can visit our website, thebadroman.com. Until next time, remember, sometimes being a good Christian means being a bad Roman.